Good morning. Good morning, Judy. Good, Good morning, morning. Uh, Brad. Uh, it is nine o'clock uh, here in California. I am Francis Savignan, the founder and CEO of Epar Trade. Welcome uh, to this uh, double feature today, right, Judy? Yep, we have a double feature. We're going to be uh, talking a chassis setup with the great people from Intercomp. Uh, they were invited uh, to participate in online race industry week back in December, but they only had the 30 uh, minute slots. So this time we're going to spend a full hour uh, with Chris and Carter. So we'll go deeper in everything they have to offer. And then we are going to be joined by Marshall Prutt. And uh, this is a, a session that's co-produced with racer.com. And uh, we're going to have the president of SVRA and the president of Transam telling us uh, what they have in the plans for uh, the upcoming uh, uh, season. And but talking about racing, we, we went to a pretty good race this weekend, Judy, right? Yes, hit the NHRA out in Vegas, spent two days, and it was so wonderful to connect with industry friends. Saw k &N out there, Dart and Sleeves, uh, Marwin, Reed Rocker Arms, DHL. So it was just wonderful. We spoke to TRD. So it was a good two days and good to be at a race again. Uh, absolutely. So I'm getting a signal uh, that uh, uh, from a producer that Chris and Carter are coming on. So Brad Gilly, I think we're going to let you take over. <laughs> and uh, so how are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you very much, Francis. Really looking forward to this one as well uh, with Chris from Intercomp and Carter from Elite Shock Services. I think, uh, I think there's going to be a lot learned here today and a lot of great stuff to be talked about as well. And I see that Chris is on, but their camera is not on, neither their mic. So we're going to ask them to start their camera and start their video and to unmute. Um, and uh, ah. the, I think they're coming on. So yeah, we're back here. We're just trying to uh, yeah. get connected. Ah, well, we'll wait, uh, you know, until- Technology. Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, Brad, any any good uh, uh, stories on your side? You know, just uh, honestly, the story of um, you know watching how this continues to grow and watching everything week by week and everything that's been going on with Epar Trade and uh, and race industry. Now, it was really neat last week to see Jeff Hammond and Daryl Gwynn and everything that they were doing. That was a lot of fun, and I know today is going to be a lot of fun as well. But you know, over here, I'm just actually sitting here at Charlotte Motor Speedway. Um, I know there's going to be some drag racing here in a few weeks and, of course, some NASCAR racing coming up a few weeks after that. So it's great to be on social media and see it doesn't matter what form of racing. The World of Outlaws are at Bristol Motor Speedway this weekend. You know, we've got modifieds and late models racing everywhere. We've got drag racing and road racing and, you know, short track oval racing on asphalt and concrete. Everything that we've got going on is in full swing, which, let's be honest, this time last year, we were all wondering when we were being, going to be able to get back to it. But as we all know, racers find a way absolutely and that's exactly what happened racers found a solution because both chris and carter is a racer correct uh, yes. uh, yeah yeah found <laughs> a way around the problem that's very good, problem good. Problem. So we'll let you on and then we'll see you in uh, uh, about 55 58 minutes thank you guys thank, thank you thank you thank you Tracy. thank you judy all right. Well, uh, welcome, Chris and Carter. Um, today's theme, uh, the title for today's uh, race industry now is get a grip on chassis setup to maximize race car handling. And, and by the way, gentlemen, I love where you guys are because um, it's going to be a lot of great show and tell as well as talking. But if uh, if you're new to joining us here on EPAR Trade for Race Industry Now, we're basically going to spend the better part of the next hour talking about all of the great things that Intercomp has to offer to the racing industry. And if you have a question along the way, just use the chat feature and type it in the chat and we will uh, definitely get your questions, as many of them as we can. We've got a lot of great things that we're going to be talking about. And our guest today, the market specialist from Intercomp, Chris Berg, 
and also the owner of Elite Shock Services, Carter Gerlock. And, and I hope I pronounced your last name correctly, Carter. If I didn't, I apologize. <laughs> I see you nodding. And, um, and if you want to see them real big in your screen, um, then depending on what you're viewing this on, be it a computer or a tablet or something, you could certainly select the view to uh, take whoever's talking and that will give you the bigger view as well. Uh, but Chris, first of all, let's just start with you and what we're going to be talking about today. I know it's obviously just more than putting down four scale pads and weighing a race car because there's so much more technology that Intercomp has to offer. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty well, Brad. Uh, how are you doing today? Fantastic. This is just a fun, awesome thing to be able to talk about here. So I'm looking forward to it. And, you know, as far as race car setup, I was, you, you and I were talking earlier. Um, heck, it's been more than a decade since I've even messed with anything when it comes to race car setup or anything. And then it was literally putting down just four scale pads. But now we have so many more technologies from Bluetooth to load stick technology. And I know Intercomp has really uh, taken a deep dive into all of that to, uh, to the benefit of the race industry. So give us a little bit of an overview, if you will. Well, quick overview. Um, we do have a lot of products for the racing industry. Um, like you've mentioned, uh, we're pretty well known for our scale systems, our uh, pad scale systems. Um, we have both wireless and cabled systems. Um, additionally, we have a bunch of different other tuning items like our shock dynos. Um, so we have two of those and uh, we also have other various um, suspension type equipment um, that uh, really helps the racer fine tune their setup for their car. Well, let's talk about load sticks, and I see one of them sitting right there in front of Carter. Um, with what Intercomp does, uh, and, and you know the development that you guys have been doing with this technology, what makes Intercomp's load stick different from some of the others that we see on the market? Well, the biggest thing that that uh, we worked on at the inception of this project is we wanted to um, we kind of wanted to raise the bar, and with that, we uh, integrated a new technology in our Bluetooth wireless technology that we had that we had first developed that we were the industry leader in the, in the scale market on. And we took that, that, that technology over to our, our new load stick design. Uh, we wanted, we wanted to have something new cutting edge and different than different than the market had ever seen before. So um, the ability for this to measure our loads off of a, a wireless indicator is definitely uh, a technology and a feature that, that we pride ourselves on with this. And, and what we really, what, really we find uh, as the advantage is first of all um, instead of uh, numbers and and loads being right out there right out in the open for everybody to see all the time which as the load stick uh, load stick technology has as evolved you're seeing more and more people across the pits that have them um, having the ability to be a little bit uh, anonymous about your setup uh, has become more of a premium and also uh, once again, with load stick technology becoming, uh, you know, a front runner in our setups, the the ability to do more than one, um, the ability to do more than one wheel at a time and really uh, do things a lot quicker. Um, where with our with our technology, you can buy one indicator with one load stick, and it will take, and we can add we can add sticks in up to four onto our onto our platform so you could you could essentially load stick an entire car off of off of one session now um i did see in the chat i'll hit hit on that right away what is a load stick uh right here what you're looking at is a load stick with a um so what a load stick is is it is a piece of measurement equipment that gives us the ability to measure the actual spring load that is being um exerted at a given center center on a car or at a given um, given height. So uh, traditionally, we use our scale pads to get our wheel weights. Uh, what a load stick is, is it's just an added technology and an added setup feature to where I can put this in in a situation where, where my sh uh, traditionally we'll see where our shock would bolt in. We'll put that in there. We'll pull the shock. We'll get a ride, uh, ride height or a center to center measurement. We'll put that in there. And then we will just uh, take pressure off of the tire or off of the suspension and let it lift up. And that'll tell us exactly how much spring force is actually pushing down at that point uh, where the load stick is located. So you might ask, you know, what, what's the difference? Um, one big thing is we can isolate wheels with, a lo with load sticks. Um, if uh, any, anybody on here that has ever uh, scaled a race car, you're going to know that when you 
when you uh, when you manipulate manipulate one corner of the car, it is going to affect another wheel weight, and that is what we are looking to see within our setups. A load stick is going to tell us that um, it'll isolate that corner, and when we put turns in or we uh, turns out of a corner and we make some adjustments, it'll tell us how much actual physical spring pressure we're putting down there and how much, and then we, we equate that we call that load. So how much how much spring load essentially is is being put on it. The technology itself is uh, is pretty fascinating, and you'd mentioned uh, as well. And Carter or Chris, whoever wants to take this, um, you know, you could do up to four wheels. Now, um, can you do one wheel at a time, two wheels at a time? What's the way uh, that the whole system works? Yeah, I, I can take that one. Um, yeah, you can do one wheel at a time, two wheels at a time. Um, we do the way we sell that our load sticks is the single load stick, um, which is uh, one thing that's pretty common on the market these days. And uh, we do have the two load stick set as well as the four load stick set. So it's usually best to measure, you know, either in that single wheel, uh, single corner of the car, uh, two corners of the car, or you can go to all four corners. Doing three corners doesn't really do you a whole lot. It's kind of a stick with the even numbers uh, plus the one. So if I'm now using load sticks, how does this, does this integrate with the scales? Is it something I use independently of the scales? And what exactly is it going to tell me? Is it going to tell me what springs I need to be putting on, you know, based on where my setup is? Basically, um, yes, I, which it, it is a separate feature from the scales. Um, when we, when we uh, traditionally over the years, when we have scaled a race car, we are taking, um, no matter what, off of your scales, your percentages, uh, the left, you know, and traditionally I, I come from a, a circle track background, so I talk a lot of circle track stuff. So, you know, we are concerned with uh, um, the, you know, a left side percentage and a rear percentage in the car. No matter what we do with the setup on the car, mainly our loads per wheel, no matter what we do with the load or how much spring pressure we have on them, your left side and your rear percentage are going to stay the same. So your actual, your actual physical weights in the back of the car or on either side of the car, they're going to stay the same. How they are distributed um, between the wheels is going to be adjusted by load. Traditionally, over the years, we have looked at that load distribution through the scales, which is still important uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, knowing those, those concrete weights uh, physical weight to the car, obviously for, for teching reasons and also for setup reasons, um, traditional setups and how vehicles and uh, vehicles are still set up. Most of your, uh, should I say, baselines are going to be set up off of scale numbers. So we can, we can correlate that to our, to our load numbers. And like I was saying before, um, a load stick really, it really isolates that corner of the car and sometimes we will look, and what I've, I've worked with a lot with our customers is, is um, seeing what the relationship is. I say, well, okay, when we're scaling, we put we put on scales, we change we change the load on it, and it shows you this on the scales. Really, you're doing you, whether you put whether you whether you put a turn in on the scales or you put a turn in and you put the load stick on, it's going to do the same thing to the car. So the setup is going to change identical. It doesn't it doesn't matter what kind of setup equipment you're putting on. It's just going to show me in a different fashion. What the load sticks have done is really allowed us to um, once again isolate certain wheels and, and look at the setup in a different way. We've always known uh, if we have, um, you know, when we're putting turns in or taking turns out, kind of what we're, what we're trying to attain, but it, it also uh, affects other corners of the car. And sometimes we work around that. And we've kind of learned that maybe isolating those corners a little bit more is, is possibly. Uh, um, in some cases with our setups, a more accurate way to set the car up and, and to, to physically see a change with it. Now, correct me if I'm wrong here, Carter, but a really simplistic way you could almost look at it and, I, and think about the relationship between scales and load sticks is load sticks almost look at more of the dynamic, um, with the way the chassis is acting in a dynamic mode when it's going around a corner. In the scale, you're looking more at the, uh, more to a little bit more of a static type of setup, setting ride heights, things like that. Is that, is that a pretty easy way to think about it? Absolutely. Um, and the other thing, uh, as Chris mentioned, with a, with a load stick, we are able to set a car in attitude. We're able to pull it down. So with uh, what you've seen, uh, certain styles of racing, the cars are going to have a lot of movement on corners of the car. We can simulate that movement. You can pull that car down just on that corner to see what kind of load we are looking at. 
And once again, the chassis builders are moving in a certain direction where they're starting to give you load numbers and say, okay, here's your load number at this height. And then if you pull it down to this height, this is kind of what I want to see when you integrate bump stop technology and the new spring technology we see, uh, there's a lot of tunability with that. And it's just without pulling the car down into attitude with, uh, in, in some fashion, you're not able to see those loads. So it's just, it's, it's just elevating, elevating our ability to, to, to tune on a race car essentially. Yeah, really, um, it really just gives you a better idea of the total picture of what that race car chassis and the suspension are doing. Um, so yeah, it just gives you a better picture better overall picture and understanding of what's going on when you're out on the racetrack. So for people watching right now, in their mind, they're thinking of their own form of racing, whatever they're doing. And I'm sure we have, you know, uh, asphalt oval racers. We've got road racers. We've got dirt racers. We've got drag racers. We pretty much run the gamut of people here who are participating in race industry now uh, on EPAR trade. Who does this benefit? Who is uh, Who can make the most out of this technology? Well, I would definitely say at this point, uh, load stick technology has been very heavily used and um, heavily developed in the in our oval track uh, racing um, pavement pavement late models, um, pavement sportsman cars, and and a lot and, and dirt dirt racing has definitely where you are seeing a where you're seeing I, I I'll be honest with you where you're seeing something where you have a lot of movement in the chassis um, definitely with our with our oval track racing and dirt racing in general the cars have a lot of attitude meaning how they're going to sit in the staging lane and how they're going to sit rolling around the track is going to be much different than it is as it is in race attitude so I would say um, primarily you're seeing the development and the push with this with the um, within the oval track community now. The one thing that we are seeing a lot more of, uh, and especially with, with my shock background and, and how we're, we work with, I work with people in every single industry across the world with their shocks and their coilovers. Um, when people are trying to make a spring change on anything, load stick technology is applicable to everything. It is going to be uh, where if you want that exact same spring rate, you wanna make a spring change on something, and you say, but I want it to be at the same, you know, a lot of people equate it to ride height, but I, but I want to keep the same load. I just want to stiffen spring or I just want to soften spring. The load six can give you that opportunity that, that gives you that, that picture right away. You say, okay, I change, I change up that spring. My load numbers back to this. This is how many turns I need to put into it. This is how much adjustment I need to do. And we work from there. So it's really applicable. And we're going to see uh, more and more as time uh, moves along this technology being heavily used in in the basically all the markets you you hit on there yeah, a couple of questions from the chat um the the, the most recent one that just came in i, I want to ask first it says is this equipment available uh free to learn the characteristics of one vehicle not certain that the outright purchase is feasible for many teams um and I think more of what I'm thinking too is learning this technology, getting the data that the load sticks provide. How hard is it to figure out what do I now need to do with that? That's a really good, that's a really, really good question. Like, okay, I've got this information. Now what do I do with it? I would, I would say that really you would, um, you would say it's similar to your scale numbers or any other baseline on your car. This is a new baseline. It's a new baseline technology where, um, where you say, what, what is my baseline? Where's my information coming from? Where, where's my flood of information coming from? So you got a twofold. In some, uh, in some arenas of racing, you have got where the actual builder, whoever you're getting your information from, and you are trying to tune on your car, uh, you're getting that from, you're right. They want to come up with that baseline. You're just checking it and, and feeding it back. No different than scale numbers or any other setting on the car. Now the question would be, okay, so I don't, I don't have a baseline with a chassis builder. They don't have load sticks. They don't do this. This is your opportunity. And we've seen this a lot over the years with our shock dynos. Um, we handle um, with at, at Elite Shocks, we handle the majority of the, of the shock dyno uh, market. And with that, I've seen, uh, I, I find this similar to our shocks where uh, for years, a lot of times a chassis builder did not have the shock data or the for the racer. And so the racer went and they purchased it themselves and they tried to get a leg up on the competition. And the same thing is happening with our load sticks. The, 
with this load stick technology, you're right, you may have no baseline, but you know where your car works or what your setup is on scales. What I, what I tell people to do is take that technology or take that setup, excuse me, and put the load stick on her right where you're at and just start playing with it and then tuning from there. And it really gives you an advantage and uh, over, over the competition. If, if nobody else is using a load stick and setting their vehicle off of loads, um, typically we're just looking, we're looking for that, that advantage. So it can be a twofold, either, either your baseline set, and this is one part of your baseline from your information stream that you're getting, or this is your new baseline that you add to your existing. And there's also a lot of information out there that uh, you can find on the internet. And, uh, you know, we're working on putting together uh, instructional videos and things like that uh, to help our customers out um, with this relatively new technology, um, just kind of wrapping folks' heads around what's going on. Yeah, Chris, if someone wanted to, you know, learn more about it, put their hands on it, maybe even potentially demo it, is this something that you would just recommend they go to their local retailer or distributor to you know, get some information on them to at least, you know, physically put their hands on it? Yeah, it would probably be best to uh, talk to any one of the, I guess, your local uh, intercom uh, dealer would be your best place to go uh, to begin kind of talking to those folks, seeing um, what their their programs are. Um, and then we could uh, potentially uh, work with uh, those dealers to figure out some sort of program. But um, we don't have anything at this time. Um, that's quite like that, uh, you know, kind of free to free to try it out, free to demo run. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I would say the first place to go would be to uh, go to one of the uh, intercom dealers. Yeah, no, that's that's great. And there's a lot of great ones across the country. I mean, Intercomp is uh, so ingrained in all forms of racing and and uh, it's great that you guys are everywhere. There was one question says, is a load stick actuated with air pressure? I guess maybe is how does it work? Um, question apply here. I'm assuming the question is um, as far as as uh, manipulating the center center on the on the load stick, it is just use a, a simple double adjuster. So when you look at this, it's going to you are actually going to turn this hexagonal tube and it will just it will just uh actuate up and down based on um based on threads so it's not run off of air um it does use it does use an s-beam load uh load stick on it to measure our forces um the same things we put in our the the, the same level we put in our scales yeah you guys had mentioned, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about Bluetooth. Maybe we can get a little more into that as well. But, but you know, sitting there looking at the uh, the two displays in front of you, one next to the scale pad, one next to the load stick, are these interchangeable displays? Could I could I see both on one, or is it two separate systems in that way? Um, right now, it's uh, it's two separate systems um, since you would have to reprogram um, the radio frequencies. Um, so potentially, you could run a set of load sticks or a set of scales off of a single indicator, but you would have to go in and do some reprogramming in order to do that. So typically it's just gonna be easier um, to have one indicator uh, for each system. That way you're able to um, know exactly what you're looking at instead of getting the two, um, two systems and uh, the data confused. Yeah, that makes sense. But with the Bluetooth technology, now we're talking about being able to Bluetooth straight to our phones and um, really have a lot more conveniences with that. Could you elaborate more on that? Go ahead. Yeah, uh, we just uh, we came out with our Bluetooth technology and our wire came out with our wireless technology uh, close to a decade ago, and with that came along the, the Bluetooth technology that was with it. Um, it has really become of a premium for people to. Uh, work off of their off of their phones. Essentially, I'll, I'll just I'll just call it what it is. Everybody um, seems to be on their phones, and 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 trying to log that data and 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 keep track of it has really become of a premium. Uh, also, and so being able to run this straight to your phone and have that capability, we have really found a lot of traction with, and 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 essentially we have a ton of. Uh, ton of people that have, have gone that route. Racing, I, um, I say in about a five year span, I went from being one of the younger guys to now one of the older guys. Um, we're really seeing back when we were able to have some trade shows, uh, you know, the younger generations, the younger generations coming through and everybody in the younger generation, they want, they want to be able to run 
Bluetooth to their phone. It just for ease. Um, basically, our whole world is, is is running on that platform. So the setups of our race car are are shifting that direction. It really and it, it just it's really advantageous and just very convenient to be honest. And just to clarify a little bit, um, the so when we're talking about Bluetooth, we're actually talking about uh, Bluetooth from the indicator to the mobile device. Um, but we still use our RFX wireless technology, which, as Carter said, has been is over a decade old, has been proven at the top levels of motorsports, um, and really is uh, is relied upon by a lot of pro teams, uh, a lot of uh, amateur racers out there. Um, so if you're if you're communicating between the scale pad and the indicator, it's going to be RFX technology. If you want to communicate from your indicator to a mobile device. Um, it's going to be using that Bluetooth technology. And one of the other advantages um, that uh, Carter didn't mention is uh, the ability to send uh, scale data to somebody that maybe is not at the track. Uh, maybe it's a specialist like Carter. Um, you could, you may be at home, somebody, one of your customers may be at the racetrack. They have a question about uh, a corner weight, you know, what, uh, what one of their shocks is doing, what one of, uh, you know, something they're seeing on the load stick that they don't quite understand or haven't um, seen before. What they can do is uh, take that data and uh, you can either email it or you could even text message an image um, to that uh, specialist offsite and uh, just eases uh, communication. Yeah, I think that's great. I mean, you know, on a bigger scale, say in NASCAR, they're so limited to the amount of crew members that they can have that all of these teams have their bid command center back at their race shop. And on a smaller scale, maybe I'm just a private racer going out there and, you know, maybe Chris is my guy or, or uh, Carter is my guy. And, uh, you, you know, I can, to me, I look at something like this and now Carter can look at exactly what he wants to look at rather than rely on me giving him information that may not exactly be the same seems way more efficient that way. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I'll be, I'll be blunt. Just even before this seminar started, I, I received a text from two different customers of mine where they asked, you know, they're trying to tune for the track for this weekend. Uh, one of them said, you know, we got a lot of rain uh, the tracks me a little bit grippier. Um, a, a quick adjustment to the car and a, and a, and a predictable adjustment to the car we are, we are talking about changing the load in one corner of the car, how that affects other corners. We really, you know, we have found, like I said, we have found most gains in the current setups with changing, with isolating those corners. And that is where this, the, the load stick top technology really helps us. And, um, and, and it's really just, it's moved our setups forward where uh, we were a little bit stuck in a rut for some years. Um, for a few years or for, you know, until this came out and kind of, and kind of looked at it, looked at it differently um, for that, for that reason. The, uh, the other thing I'm just looking down in the chat and uh, Randy asked, uh, does this or can this replace a pull down rig in a, uh, that is used by NASCAR teams? Um, I definitely would say that uh, load stick technology is not going to replace it. Um, uh, once again, you are taking, you can, uh, there's certain things you can see pulling the car down, the whole car down uh, to what we would consider our dynamic heights, where you can see, once again, you can see the whole picture of a few different things of how, how it's affecting it there. But I will be honest with you, uh, very quickly at a racetrack or in your shop, putting a load stick on is going to be much quicker and it's gonna be much more economical and uh, efficient. Um, the pull down rigs, are uh, very useful. We're seeing them in all forms of racing. Um, it's not not uncommon. But this is this is kind of this is this technology and the thought of moving in the direction of checking my loads. It came from it came from the pull down rig uh, era, essentially. And when we started pulling cars down, then we said, you know what? Every race, uh, you know, essentially it was, can every racer have a pull down rig? Um, probably not. It's, you know, like I said, it's going to be just um, much too cost prohibitive and space prohibitive, um, but mainly cost prohibitive, I would say, to have a pull down rig there. And our setups are based on a, a pull down numbers. This is a step in that direction. So I would say that you're, you're, you're taking that step in the pull down direction, but you have something uh, that is much more economical to use. 
and, and much more realistic for, for your average uh, team that um, that's not a professional team also, you know, it, uh, so that is, that's, that's my answer to that, Randy. I hope I, hopefully I covered it. Um, also, Marshall has uh, chimed in here and he asked, uh, Boat 6, anything in the works for stock mount shocks? We, uh, we easily, very easily can adapt these. Uh, we already have adapters made for stock mount rear shocks. Um, that's, that's a fairly simple so the fix that traditionally uh, the majority of your vehicles uh, for stock mount, um, if they are not on a double bearing setup like this, they're going to be on a T-bar setup of some sort, which we, we, we can integrate directly into our setup right now. These rod ends are replaceable. We can put different adapters on them. Um, in the arena, for those of you racing stock mount cars, um, what we have seen and what we have done with uh, low numbers on our stock mount stuff is we will just weld a tab into the cars. We have put a tab where you can put this in there and maybe that's not where your shock mounts in the car, but you will get all of your, your load numbers off of that. And it's going to be predictable. So as long as this is in the same spot, as long as that, that those, those tabs don't uh, move on you after they're welded, that is going to be your baseline. So I have a multitude of people in stock mount formats where they're running a stock mount shock on the front, but we are working on pull down uh, load numbers, dynamic load numbers and static load numbers on those vehicles. They're no different. It's, it's as simple as it's as simple as putting a shock mount on the top and the bottom. Yeah. And that is a great point. Just having that same spot every time, even though it may not be the spot, but that makes total sense. Getting back to the economics of it too, you know, I mean, sometimes you have to sort of look at the cost versus the benefit. And obviously the cost of this system, as compared to having a big full blown pull down rig, um, it seems like this would be a way more economical way to go and would actually see the benefits. But you had also mentioned as well, Carter, that isolating corners. Now, uh, this system is sold in one, two or four load stick systems as well. So you don't have to buy all four corners if you're working on a budget. And, and really what you're saying too, is there's a huge benefit even to just having the one. Absolutely. The, and the other thing is too, just having the one, um, you know, primarily the, the sets we sold or the, uh, you know, we, we sell one and the advantage of it is, is you don't have to buy two, yeah, two or four at a time. It's not like if you buy the one, then it's like, okay, I'm just stuck with the one load stick you can add them in at a reduced price from not at, uh, not getting the indicator with it. So for your, your teams where it's like, I want to try to do this. I want to try to uh, utilize load stick technology. I don't really think I need two of them off the get go. I'm not really, I'm not really sure on that. You absolutely buy another load stick. Okay. At a reduce, it's going to be less than our, than, than what our uh, combination indicator load stick is. And you can add them in. You can, you can add them in one at a time. And like Chris is saying, even if you want three of them, you could, you could have three in there if you would like. Um, the cost on them, the uh, re one stick and the indicator cost is $845. And that, um, and that is, um, that is for, like I said, one stick and, and the indicator. So, and we do have, uh, you know, the dual, Sticks with one indicator is going to be twelve forty-five, and a four-piece uh, setup is going to be uh, twenty-two ninety-five. And just to give you an idea, of when replacing sticks, a single stick without the indicator is going to be five forty-five to add on. So it's something you can—it's something you can kind of back into. Also, it's not—it's not an all-or-none deal. And I definitely understand that with the majority of my customer base. Um, heck having one of them is, is they, you know, that's more than they've, they've ever utilized. So um, you don't, you know, don't feel like you have to, it, it's not an all or none yeah. situation and something that we, you know, we have designed as a modular setup to, to add. Yeah. We, yeah. I mean, we, when it comes down to it, we want to be there to, uh, you know, support, support racers and their growth as far as, uh, you know, their technical knowledge and uh, technical experience you know, we want to be there from beginning to end, really. And uh, this is a great way to allow us to kind of uh, grow with our customers as they get more technologically savvy. And it's also an advantage when I was looking at uh, what Dwayne was saying about it being uh, asked about the cost and then and, and it was and said it was pretty reasonable. We were, uh, we've had a very, uh, definitely been to our advantage that this technology that we're integrating over here that is an industry first 
uh, we integrated first with our scales and that we, we perfected this technology over the past decade. And now we're just adding it to a different, a different line. So we can be extremely competitive and, and extremely reasonable for, um, like I said, for, for the racer, for the, for the, you know, uh, amateur team also. I, I'm Not thinking just... for, for less than the cost of a set of tires. Now you have some technology that you're going to have with you week in and week out at the racetrack, at the shop. That actually does sound very, very reasonable. And especially, you know, considering if you're already an Intercomp customer and you're used to just the interfaces and everything in the way Intercomp works, which I know a lot of people are, obviously, in this racing industry, it seems like a huge benefit. I mean, it's a massive benefit. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's using the same exact technology, kind of what Carter was getting at, too. Um, you know, using that same exact wireless technology that, you know, the NASCAR Cup teams, everybody in the NASCAR garage, um, you know, whether it's Xfinity, uh, Trucks, or Cup Series, almost all of those teams are um, using some form of our scale system and our wireless technology. So they've really come to um, really rely on that. And uh, it's something that they just, they need that, need that data, need that uh, consistent data when they're at the track in order to you know, compete at the highest level. All right. So when it comes to wireless technology and Bluetooth, um, you know, there are certain nefarious people out there who might start thinking about hacking and, you know, how can I tie into your system to see what you're doing? How secure is this? We, um, it, that, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and one that the only reason I'm uh, chuckling a little bit is I just, I remember when we came out with this. Um, I've been with uh, Intercom for a long time also. And uh, when we came out, that was the first question that was asked in the cup garages. I don't want, I don't want the, you know, as a person just going to be able to log on their phone or, or find, is there going to be a way to hack into this? And we really, it, it just really has not been an issue. Um, every single indicator, the security, uh, the security with them, you would need the encryption codes and everything that we have set up for that uh, Bluetooth channel, essentially, it's, it's, it's extremely secure or else, like you said, uh, you wouldn't see, you wouldn't see everybody in the cup garage using some, some form of it. Um, but it was definitely, I mean, that was, that was the first and foremost question is, man, can I, I'm, you want me to switch this wireless stuff now, person next to me can see it. And, um, we had that on the radar to begin with. And like I said, once again, just something that we're not worried about with, with our new technology or our existing technology um, that we, uh, yeah, so we've been, it was, uh, that, was, uh, that was a big deal to begin with. Well, and as Carter mentioned, it was something that we had, um, we had kind of uh, thought about going into it. So really, if you were talking about um, just the security, getting down to kind of the nuts and bolts in order to know and be able to see somebody else's scale data, you not only have to know um, the radio frequency that they're using, but there's also an encryption code that you would need to know. And it's the same sort of system with the uh, Bluetooth. As the, um, as the user of the indicator, um, somebody can't just in, in the garage walk by with their Bluetooth phone on and uh, discover your indicator and grab your data. Um, that person running the actual indicator where the Bluetooth is being uh, transmitted from, they need to accept that uh, mobile device user in order to allow that person to see the data. And with that being said, you know, maybe I'm a big team and I've got five engineers or maybe I'm just a, you know, a weekend racer and I've got a buddy helping me out. How many people can log into this at one time? I mean, could I have it on my phone and my buddy has it on his phone as well? And, you know, that way we might be wanting to look at two different things, but at yeah. least we're both getting the data at the same time. Right. So with the, uh, with the Bluetooth connection, it's only uh, connecting one mobile device uh, to the indicator here. The nice thing, though, is that... Um, aside from running the uh, wireless between the indicator and the scales, we also have a computer program that can also interface with the scale system at the same time that you're running this. So you could have the computer system be your primary system that runs the scales, or you could have this indicator be the primary system. And, you know, you could have your race engineer sitting at the computer in the race trailer, um, somebody uh, like a crew chief or something like that, having the indicator in their hand, and then um, you know a just a regular mechanic making an adjustment on the corner of a race car, 
um, they could have their mobile device and uh, be able to see all those changes. Everybody be able to see all those changes in real time. And the wow. other thing we look, the other thing we look at with it also is with as many uh, Bluetooth enabled devices as we have in any given pit. If it was, um, if we opened up that channel to everybody, there'd be, you know, at a at a, a NASCAR race, for instance, there'd be 30, 40, 50 intercomp discoverable devices. Yeah. Even if you didn't have the password, it would it, it would it would fill it would fill it up. So the um, so it, it it is part of that part of that security deal that we did think about off the get go was um, was making it a single a single user setup in that fashion. Yeah. All right. Um, if anyone has a question, by the way, you are always welcome to just type it into the chat. We'll answer anything that uh, you've got uh, for uh, either Chris or Carter, which this is just a lot of fun technology to talk about. And we talked about the load sticks and the scales. Let's talk about uh, the Hubscale 360 as well, if yeah. we could. Uh, this is personally one of my favorite products. Um, I'm a road racer. Uh, that's kind of my background. Um, and this is one of the products that we see used a lot in the road racing industry. Um, when you go out to the Daytona 24, um, go to the Sebring, uh, you know, 12 hours of Sebring, um, you'll see a lot of the teams using systems like this. And there's also teams using our system down there. Um, you know, it, it, instead of the pad design where you roll your car, you know, tires and all onto the pad, you actually remove the tire and wheel assembly and uh, put this piece directly on to the hub. And uh, there's actually a uh, load cell down here in the base that's uh, protected. And uh, it will actually take that measurement of that weight at that corner. And you put one of those on each of the four corners. So um, yeah, it's a really, uh, really pretty neat system. Um, just takes out a lot of those variables like uh, bent rims, um, you know, uneven wear on tires, uh, you know, all that little stuff that can just start throwing weights off slightly. Um, and it also works really well for uh, race cars that are really um, can be finicky, uh, you know, kind of those purebred race cars that are meant for the track. Um, you know, a, a pound here, a pound there may not seem like much, but in those type of cars, it could be the difference between being really tight going into a corner or really loose going into a corner. That's pretty fascinating, just being being tied directly into the race car uh, like it is and attached directly into the race car. And you know, how hard is this to manipulate, to move around and all of that? I mean, typically you set up your scales and, and you can roll up on them and they, they stay where they are. Um, you know, this is it. Uh, does the base of this stay in the same place and it moves in? And how does it work? Yeah. Uh, what The nice thing about this is that uh, you can actually it's it's something that you can actually move out of the way if you need. Um, to have the car sitting on sitting on the ground, you can just make tape marks um, in your uh, in your pit area, and uh, you could that'll allow you to bring this base back to back to that same point every time. The other nice thing about this triangle base is that it has three adjustment screws here that allow you to adjust the height up and down on each corner. So um, it allows each uh, each corner to be. Um, you know, kind of adjusted for height, any sort of imperfections in the surface that you're working on. So it's just really nice, uh, nice system in that way. It's pretty, uh, pretty nice and modular. Yeah, I like and, and if you walk into any garage after a race weekend, you're going to see a lot of little painted circles everywhere. <laughs> and, and, you know, a great way to do it. A great question came in. The hub scale system, is it compatible, compatible with multi lug cars or, or just cars with the center lock only? Yeah, um, no, it's uh, it's compatible with a full um, whole bunch of cars. Um, we've had teams that uh, will have one set of scales. They'll use it um, use it on a GT3 race car, GT3 Porsche, for instance, and uh, they'll also be running a uh, Hyundai TCR car. So they're able to change out this inner part here, and uh, also we have spacers that will change how far out the uh, the the what we call the mid plate is from the battery box here, so you can move it out for different uh, different widths of car, um, and uh, yeah, the adapters you can do anything from a five lug pattern. If you have a car with four lugs, uh, we can certainly uh, you, you can get a, uh, a 
a adapter to be able to um, get that car mounted on one of these hub scales. So give us an idea of, you know, whether we're just working with the flat pad scales or the hub scale, and then, um, you know, with the load sticks and everything, what's the workflow involved in all of this? When I'm looking at setting up my race car, you know, what, what is, you know, sort of A, B, C, D, how does that work? Well, Carter, I think uh, you'd be the best one to answer the yeah. Uh, workflow. Yeah, um, you know, working with within, and, and, and I'll be honest with you, different types of cars are gonna, they're gonna have a different work, a different workflow to them and a different set of baselines. And, and whenever we talk about setup, we're just talking, we're talking baseline, 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 whether it be our uh, tire pressures or it be, or it be our uh, numbers on scale pads or num numbers on a low stick or a hub scale. A lot of it's just gonna be doing it the exact same every time. And when we talk about setting up a race car, um, typically, the hardware of the car we are going to we are going to concentrate on first and i and i will i'll use the example of uh well uh in the oval track arena any 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 sort of bar car that we're that we're looking at uh, a late model or a modified for instance we're going to get our we're going to have our bar set up uh and all of our hardware set up in the spot we need to have it first and then and then we will um and then we will get down to the brass tacks you know checking air pressures and checking some of the other 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 setup features that we have on the cars any any sort of tuner that we'll have on the cars and then we'll we'll look at our springs we'll look at the springs any car that we're gonna have we're gonna look at springs what rate we have the springs and then that is where that is where it moves on to this equipment that's where it moves on to um you know traditionally on a on a vehicle we are going to set it to a a, a set ride height we are gonna we are gonna move it to a set ride height that we uh, sometimes in in some cases that uh, we look at in our both our pavement and our oval arena a ride height that's mandated by the rules. Maybe maybe we're maybe we have uh, we have uh, you know rules that we're working with and we have to we have to work within a certain parameter on the ride height. Um, and so we'll get the car to a to a height that we're that we're comfortable with, and then we start manipulating from there. And the one thing I would say, and this is what I. Um, Back to when we talked about the load sticks versus scales, you can we can get a car, we could have it scaled the exact same way with the same percentages um, and same cross. We can get it and we can get that a multitude of different ways on scales and we can get it a multitude of different ways with our load sticks. Um, and so seeing what, uh, after we get the car to a rough height and going forward with the setup, then rolling it up onto the scales and seeing what our, our true wheel weights are and then from there manipulating it and saying okay this is how much load i have this is what the height of it is this is what my wheel weights are this is what i'm used to all right i'm gonna put the load stick on there and see how much load i have in each corner of the car because i may have a weight jack or a, a coil over nut adjusted way down on one side and that is holding the other side up actually and okay it's like well i can run that one down on i could run the left rear down i can that can take some load That'll put some load in the left rear and it'll take some out and it'll run the right height up and I can take that out of the right rear. So that's really what we're talking about is not only trying to hit numbers, but tying the whole system together, tying everything together with, we've got our wheel weights. We need those to be a certain, uh, within a certain parameter. And this is what, this is what we've had success with. This is what um, maybe the, my, my information flow coming to me is. And then I tie something else into whether it be my hub skills. Maybe that's where, you know, in the road racing road, that's where that baseline's off of, you know, you walk, you walk through that pit. Um, you know, I've been over to road, uh, road America, uh, over in Wisconsin. And I mean, people live on these plates. You go to a dirt track race and people live on scales and load sticks. And, um, so it really, it just, what each car is going to take as far as the ABs and Cs is going to be a little bit different, but it all kind of kind of goes back to the same thing. Getting that hardware on the car where it needs to be. We got our, you know, you've got your your wheel bases and your your lead and your trail and all that set. So we're not going to adjust that. And then just manipulating loads on the corners. And really what you're looking at, we keep talking about load, 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 load sticks. Um manipulating scale numbers, hub scale numbers, roll-on scale numbers, you're manipulating, you're manipulating loads. And we're just looking at it in a different fashion. Yep. So yeah, and to uh, chime in, kind of from my uh, road racing standpoint, um, as Carter was kind of getting at the uh, the setup process, that workflow is really similar. 
uh, the way I kind of like to uh, talk to folks about um, when they ask me, how do you go about using a set of scales, set hub scales, whatever that may be, comes down to getting those, uh, those mechanicals, the, you know, your toes, your ride height, uh, spring rate, getting all that stuff set, putting your car on that scale system and um, seeing where you're at. And then like with a, uh, an aero-based car, like a formula car, ride heights are very important. So you adjust that ride height to get that where you're maximizing the amount of downforce that you're making. And um, then you're able to kind of see where, uh, where those wheel, um, where the ride heights leave you as far as weights go on each wheel. And then from there, once you pull off the scales, you can make um, some additional mechanical adjustments to make sure that you're back um, as far as where you want your settings, like your toe, um, your camber cast or things like that. Just make sure that stuff is where you want it to get, uh, you know, the crisp turn in um, and then uh, get your handle in through the middle of the corner and get out of the corner cleanly. Um, I had a question in the chat, hub scale versus pad scale um, cost difference, if any. Yeah, um, so the, uh, the scale, if just kind of a ballpark estimate, um, let's see, for a, for a hub scale system, um, you're looking somewhere in the ballpark of about $9,000. And I say that it's a ballpark figure because um, there are a lot of um, additions and uh, little things that you can add on. Um, you know, the, uh, you have to get the um, spacers machine um, and uh, so spacer for the hub, as well as uh, for the for the actual track width. Um, so it's a little there's a little bit more involved with purchasing a hub scale. Um, and the the regular pad scales, um, you're looking anywhere from uh, you know the, our wireless systems started just uh, you know a couple thousand dollars less than that. Yeah, you're looking so, between sixteen. But be, uh, depending on the platform, you'd like to use the, the, the pads are all going to be identical. We have a multitude of different platforms to work from. Um, our most economical set is going to be uh, our PC set. So like Chris was noting earlier, uh, we have a platform that doesn't even, uh, that has no indicator with it. It's just simply going to be a node that goes inside of our PC and then all of your data will be uh, projected on your PC. That's going to be our most economical set. And then we and then we roll into our, our platform of Bluetooth models where it's going to be. And actually, I shouldn't say that's most economical. We have our, our wired sets are going to be closer to about twelve hundred dollars. Yep. Um, so we still we do have a wired we have a, a wired set still in that twelve hundred dollar range. Um, beyond the PC wireless set, then we move into our Bluetooth technology. So you're going to have uh, you're going to have an option, um, two options there essentially. You're going to get uh, you get uh, both of them will give you an indicator with them. Uh, that indicator, well, uh, you can uh, either run right off the indicator, just look at your numbers on it and, and make your judgments off that, like we all have done for years also. Um, and then with, with this platform, you can also run to your phone. It's going to be Bluetooth enabled. Um, and then we do have, and then we basically have a third model, which we would refer to as a professional model, which is going to tie both of them together. Um, and that's going to be, that's going to be about $2,000. And what that does is that enables you, you have the indicator with, with also the Bluetooth capabilities, but you also have the node and the PC software to run to your computer. And then on top of that, with both of those uh, available, then you, and it also does come with a carrying case. So um, that's our professional model for a couple hundred dollars more. Um, so you're looking anywhere from about 1600 to 2000, depending on, on which options you would like and what, you, um, what you're after. Yeah, sounds very reasonable. Um, while we still have a couple of minutes here, uh, that nice big machine to the left of Carter right there, um, tell us about the tire purging system. So yeah, this is a, this is kind of a unique um, unique tool that we have. Um, it's a, our tire purger um, or dryer. Um, what it actually does is um, it, it essentially pulls the air out of a set of tires and then uh, runs it through a desiccant system and uh, takes the uh, humidity, it takes the water vapor out of that, uh, out of that air. And then you can actually uh, fill your tire back up with, um, with uh, nitrogen or uh, dried 
uh, compressed air, if you'd like. So that's um, that is a you know kind of a cool thing, and you're able to do that uh, on all four tires. Doesn't take any power, extra power. Um, it just needs the uh, you know needs to hook up to a system of compressed air or uh, compressed nitrogen. Wow, which is huge in having the dry air in your tires and, and literally be able to consistently uh, get the same results. If, I mean, if you don't know what, how much water vapor you might have in those tires, I mean, that's, that's a big difference. So that's a really neat system. Yep, and what, one other thing, um, just to kind of wrap things up here, I know we're kind of running short on time. Um, we do have uh, a whole, like I said earlier, a whole line of dynos um, for you know, racing applications, as well as uh, power sports applications, you know, uh, high applications where high force shocks are used. Um, so we have both a three horsepower and an eight horsepower, uh, all variable speed uh, versions. And uh, that's, um, Carter, you could probably touch on that for a minute or two, just, uh, you know, kind of talk about your experience with the shock dyno. Yeah, um, we've been using, we've been using intercom shock dynos at Elite Shocks for, the past 15 years, uh, basically since the, the, at the, the inception of the company. Um, you know, we formed a relationship with them also, um, as you can see. The, our dynos are, uh, they're, uh, you know, they're kind of an industry icon, I would say, as far as usability and user friendliness. Um, we, try to, we try to base this on our, uh, the ability for a person to train somebody and work on that dyno within the same day, keep it very, very simple, but yet lay out the data we need. It, it offers everything that a person uh, is after as far as shock data. Um, and we take them and they, like, like Chris said, they're gonna work in a multitude of different industries, not just uh, oval racing or, or road race, it's not just racing generally. Um, you know, there, there's a number of different industrial uh, applications of this and the power sports arena. Um, uh, as Chris mentioned, we do have a three horse. We got we got two different three horsepower models. We have a high speed and a standard speed model where it's going to um, it's just going to apply to different applications. Um, typically, in our short track applications, we're going to use a standard standard speed model, and then in our power sports models, we'll we'll lean more toward a toward a high speed model for for uh, for different reasons. Uh, and, and basically, you're just looking at shaft speeds of the shock, and 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 we're trying to grab certain data. And different markets and different uh, different applications are going to need different data, uh, all of which we can we can capture off our machines. Uh, the third the third machine we do have is a we do have a eight horse model that we came out with about three years ago, um, for more of your high capacity situations um, where we just saw, we saw the need and and uh, where we needed a little bit something with a little bit more grunt and in order to work in certain applications where we're, we're looking for a, a given shaft velocity and along with a certain uh, force with them. So no, we've been uh, very, very fortunate with the shock dyno line. Um, we're, uh, and once again, probably the biggest thing we, we pride ourselves on is the ease of use with it. Uh, the all three models come with a laptop with them locked, loaded, ready to go. So you can just plug them in um, and they're ready to rock and roll once you, once you get them in your shop. Wow, um, if any, I mean it's amazing the amount of resources that uh, that Intercom has to offer when it comes to chassis setup and being able to maximize the handling. And I know we've just really looked at a few things here today, but you know, for people who want more information, Chris, if they want to find more resources, where would you direct them? So um, a couple of places I would go. Uh, first off, if you want more product information, uh, go ahead and visit us at intercompracing.com. Um, and uh, that's going to be our homepage that'll allow you to get some more data um, and uh, see some application notes, um, get an idea of how other race teams, other racers use our products. Um, it, it's just a nice resource to uh, be able to figure out how these products can fit into your own racing program. Or um, I would also recommend talking to your favorite uh, favorite auto or uh, excuse me racing dealer and um they will be able to uh get you information any information you need as well well that sounds great uh chris berg uh, carter gerlock thank you both so much here today very educational and uh it's really fascinating to see the technologies that intercomp continues to develop and benefit racers with
Absolutely. Thank you very much, Chris Carter. Great to have you back. Thank you. Um, Thank you. We have pushed uh, Intercom's products uh, back on the homepage of the ePartrade platform. So you can go in there, click around, and then connect directly with Chris and, uh, and everyone in Intercom.